Thank you, Dan. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you just a brief little bit about me. I'm going to tell you about uh, what I do at the University of Richmond and what the team I work with does, um, what the driving forces for change were, um, what the change was that we accomplished, and what the outcomes were. We have plenty of time for questions and conversations, small intimate groups, so let's get going. So um, I'm the director of web services. I'm uh, responsible for the care and feeding of about 150 websites. About 140 of them are branded University of Richmond. Uh, we are fragmented into subdomains, so chemistry and anthropology and HR, and they all have their own sites. Um, some sites are two or three pages. Probably the average is 100. The biggest site's probably six, 800 pages. There's a lot of dynamic content on those pages, though. Um, I am um, a geek at heart. I've um, been a geek my whole life. Um, used to do chemistry projects in the garage, and luckily I didn't blow anybody up, including myself. Um, I'm a maker. I build stuff. My, it drives my wife crazy because I don't put it up. I just got projects everywhere. Um, but the most important thing in my life are my two daughters, and they're involved in FIRST Robotics, so they have some STEM interests. So she goes to the University of Richmond. That's Jackie, and that's Allison. She's a rising 10th grader. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about, uh, about benefits. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some heavy lifting stuff, but not too much, because this is supposed to be the business track. So what do we do at the University of Richmond in terms of the web team? As I mentioned, about 150 websites. Um, we have all kinds of websites. Um, 140 of them are branded UR and have some common look and feel here. Um, we have um, mobile-ready pages. Every page we have on the branded sites are, in fact, mobile-ready. We don't have two pages. It's just a flip of the style sheet, and off we go. So. Um, we hide some content, um, but not too much. It's all pretty much available there. Um, we integrate third-party apps. It's a routing system for our bus that goes downtown and comes back. But we also build our own mapping systems. I don't know that I have any, oh, I have one picture of, of a mapping system. We have a content management system. It's important in the context of what I'm talking about. Uh, the content management system we use is Cascade by Hannon Hill. It's a push content management system. It's not like Drupal or WordPress. You don't interact with it as a web user. We just push pages. So, um, and we've built our own mobile app. We went from zero to uh, 200 miles an hour in three months. It's Android and iPhone. Um, it's got a lot of modules in it um, that takes content now. Most of those modules take content out of the system I'm getting ready to talk about. And it's got an update wall, and the update wall has these stories you can pick based upon your preference, um, what kinds of stories come in based upon tags out of an XML database. So the wall updates, you see when this was taken, they had 15 new updates. <clears throat> um, and it also then works for our mobile pages. So sometimes we downgrade to just taking you to a mobile page for, for the expediency purposes. We learned an awful lot about this. We've had a lot of phone calls, people go, well, who did your mobile app for you? And we did it. Um, so we're very proud of the mobile app. Um, it is important in the context of what we've done that I'm talking about today, but because we're enabling certain kinds of content, both mobile and web, and it can go to other devices if we want it to. So what are the driving forces for change in the web and change at universities? Well, some of these you'll probably know about. Some may surprise you. First is cost. Everybody knows about cost. Demographic changes and competitiveness. So um, the cost of higher ed has been going sky high. You see it's double that of um, the rise in med medical cost um, and, um, and much higher than all the rest. And I don't see it abating for a while, and hopefully regulations don't come in and mess everything up. But um, for us... Um, we have to do things faster, better, cheaper. Also, demographics are changing. Now, this is kind of hard to see. Um, probably not surprising. This is, you know, Caucasian white declining. The highest curve up there is uh, Hispanic. Um, rise in Hispanics applying to college. So, now those change from their initial population. That's not overall weighted. Um, <clears throat> there's a huge tectonic shift going on in higher ed. Um, 
Fewer students are applying, um, partly because of the change in the population curve, um, partly right now because of the economy. Way more females than males. We're not fully understanding all the driving forces. 57% um, at our university um, of the freshman class are females. Um, so that's a pretty big shift. Some schools are seeing it more dramatic. Um, they're coming in savvy. They're connected. They're mobile. Um, smartphones, University of Richmond's a fairly pricey school, um, though we have some need-based students as well. They're all coming in with iPhones or Android. Most of them are iPhones or iPads. Um, they require better content. They don't want to be marketed to. They don't care about marketing. Everybody's marketed to 80 million times a day. They want to know what the experience is like. Um, and on average, students are applying to 10 colleges now. 10. When I applied to college, I think, in, which was eons ago, I was like before dirt, um, I think I applied to three places. So that's a big shift. So what does this mean? Well, some schools are going out of business. Um, some schools are not surviving. Here's uh, two examples in the last couple years. One in um, St. Paul in Virginia. Uh, St. Paul's um, closed just like three, four months ago. Uh, we're going to see more, especially li smaller liberal arts that are not particularly selective closing. Um, we have to do more with less. We have to do it faster, better. Um, and we heard that call. So we got a request in 2009 from the president's office. It said, reinvent our web. We want it to look good. We, we were now in the content management system. We had taken a couple years to get everything in. We want you to reinvent it. Um, and oh, by the way, can you do it in, in 12 weeks and we don't have any money for you? All right, so typical story, right? And we, instead of freaking, we said, wow, this is an opportunity. Um, so we had a crazy dream. We wanted uh, the ability to create experience-based content quickly. We wanted to support our factory model, which I'll talk about, that Dan calls it agili agility. We want our users to find the content easily, and we want to deliver targeted co content to specific users. So I like project names. Um, you know, I think project names help us get centered and focused. So we found this name, Artemis. Artemis is a Greek goddess. She's the goddess of wildlife. Um, she's the goddess of the hunt. And she's the goddess of childbirth, OK? Um, isn't he a cute kid? Um, that's one of my coworkers, young child, OK? So I'm going to come back. So wilderness. We had no idea where we were headed. We had no idea if we could reinvent the web in 12 weeks. And that has nothing to do with the content on the back end. That was kind of an add-on that we were trying to do. Um, we were on the hunt for a solution to those uh, principles I showed you a minute ago. Um, and when we got in the middle of it, it felt like childbirth. He's a little older than a baby. But um, so that's how Artemis came about. And his eyes are that blue. Um, so we already had a factory model. We, we're, we're scrum based. And anything that we do twice, we don't want it to be as hard the second time as the first time. So we want to, I talk about cranking the wheel. We want to crank the wheel and get productions going. We had done that with the content management system and really cranked out a lot of sites. Um, and we wanted whatever we were going to do with the content system to fit into the factory model. Okay, so here is um, a drop down. It's pretty ugly. Um, only, only the admins see all of these, because if you're, you have permissions, you probably have permissions to six or ten of these items. But that's in our content management system. And those are various little pieces of content types and whatever that you might want to access. All right? Everything comes out. Initially, everything was coming out of the content management system. You'll see some pictures in a minute. Some things are coming out of third-party APIs and other systems. <coughs> So um, we had five guiding principles. We wanted to be flexible, um, integrated content. We wanted semantic joins. Uh, we wanted the content to be single source. One of the problems in higher ed, and I think it's probably a, um, the keynote this afternoon was talking about 70 policy systems, right? We want a single source of content. Um, we wanted really clear wayfinding and navigation. 
Um, very strong storytelling, not marketing. So that was really important. We'd already started that process and we had an article system written in Oracle um, that we spent more time maintaining it than we spent getting content in it. And we, along the way, we wanted to improve business processes. Um, it's always good to get some wins that are unexpected. You know, that way you keep your job, right? So um, I had already listened to this Floss Weekly podcast because I had a system that I built in Oracle with the help of a contractor. Um, content entry was Model View Controller. It was PHP app. It was horrible to maintain. Um, the XML was just stuffed into Oracle as a blob. It was not really searchable. Um, and I wasn't, and the people that I work with in marketing were saying, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had this content type and this content type and this? And I was going home going, oh my gosh, I'll be working with Oracle until I have no hair. Oh, I have no hair, so. <laughs> Um, and I listened to this podcast, and I'm like, that's our solution, if it only works. Okay, so somewhere between that December and 2009 summer, I found Dan. We talked a little bit about how we were going to do things, and he helped us out some. He got us training and all of that. That's, um, but this, this was my inspiration. So, um, ExistDB, um, how many people know what MarkLogic is? You all know what MarkLogic is? So, a couple people. So. ExistDB is an open source XML database. MarkLogic is a proprietary XML database. Um, it's standards based. It has a REST API that was very attractive for us, real easy to get content out of, out of it. Uh, one of the really big things is it had a fast Lucene full, Turks, full, full, Turks, full text search ability. Um, and uh, XML is treated as a first class object in it. So we played with it a lot. It's pretty easy to set up. It's pretty easy to get started. Um, at the time, I don't know if it was XQuery 3. I think it was 2 at the time, but it is now XQuery 3 standards. Okay. Um, so we played with it, and we said, yeah, we think we can make this work. All right, so here is a little bit of heavy lifting. So the way the architecture is set up is we have, um, on the right, we have... Uh, Exist DB with the XQuery service and XML documents and search indexes, all of that's just built right in. We have to write the XQuery. It turns out that once you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to do. It's actually really easy, not pretty easy, it's really easy to do. Um, we use Apache web server. Someday we'll probably move to Nginx, but today we use Apache. Um, that's all of our web content is served up by Apache. But within that, we built auth and proxy services, XML to JSON service, um, XML to HTML services, and then we have other services like LDAP and whatever. So we proxy access to XML through Apache. None of our users can get to ExistDB. That way we can take full control over the look and feel because we're just getting XML out. We're not rendering it as we pull it out. We pull it out and grab it into Apache. And at that point, we put it into the DOM model um, in the web pages, right, using PHP. And so we get mobile, and we get, we get web, and we, of course we have static web pages, okay? So think of this as now a mobile platform as a service or content as a service, right? Either one or both. All right, so how do we get content in? Well, this is critical for the agility piece, okay? Our content management system, and I'll show some screens in a minute, our content management system has um, this thing called a data definition. And all it really is is a form system. You can just say, add these kinds of form features on it, name them, whatever. And then we write a little bit of XSLT transform on the back end and take the data out of the forms. We can generate it in whatever format we want. We put it into XML and we, um, we write it to a file. Okay, and then that becomes our producer endpoint for a middleware system. So this is, the middle piece here, this kind of greenish color, um, is a middleware system that we wrote. It's in, it's in Java, but it's really simple. It picks up files. Um, at the simplest, it picks up files and does an HTTP put to three ExistDB instances, one for QA and two for production. Um, but it can optionally transform stuff, so we can go look something up in Oracle, or we can change something, morph it into whatever. Um, we now have built a version service where we can write it to a versioned S3 bucket and say versions. We haven't put that into production yet, but we're soon going to do our um, university legal policies in that. 
Um, and then that becomes a consumer endpoint and gets HTTP put into the database. Okay. Um, we also then built, we have a third party, um, a little Java program that goes out to third party apps and grabs stuff from REST. We go to Twitter, we grab Twitter feeds, we go to the athletic. Um, um, the athletic sites are run by another company. We go get RSS feeds for scores and news and all of that. Um, we, we go to a lot of different systems. There's some other third party systems we go to um, in, um, with it. And then we also have a topic manager. The topic manager actually runs in Exist, um, so it's an app, even though it's over here. This is for data entry. Uh, and because it runs in Exist, it can save natively right into Exist, and we don't need to um, do an HTTP put. This is the top of a data definition, so I apologize, but this small resolution makes it hard to see. Here we have a tiny MCE-like uh, WYSIWYG. Um, and then we have other fields. That stuff goes out into those, th those data items go into the XML. It's real easy to create. Um, we have 150 users across campus that know how to put data in them. There's um, an unstyled version of the topic system. We haven't styled it yet. Dan's very embarrassed. He helped build this. It's not styled yet. We will style it soon. Um, but that goes right into the database. That's for us. That's a little knowledge management system for us to maintain topics. Okay, so that's it on the heavy lifting. Okay, so now we're going to talk a, a little bit about, so what does this all mean for us? Okay, why did we do it? Uh, we talked about the driving forces. So now, what did we achieve and why do we think those are benefits? All right, so one of the things that we have in the system are bios and uh, biographical information. We started with faculty. Now we have faculty and some staff. Um, bios show up as a bio, a full bio over there for Dr. Salisbury. Um, they show up in the directory, um, so you can get to his bio in the directory. Um, they show up in an expert guide, if they're labeled as experts, that's a place for the news media to go find who's the expert in intellectual property, who's the expert in whatever topic. Those are the ones that will take a phone call from the news. Nobody else will. Um, it shows up under faculty staff listing. That's how that got opened up over there. And here's an article. This is the experience stories that really drove the whole initiative. So this is uh, how Serving in the Peace Corps continues to affect UR professors decade later, right? And we have a semantic join that we find out who, which faculty members are involved, and really in some cases other people are involved. They show up as related content on the right. This is kind of, our inspiration was people who bought X also bought Y. That's kind of what that is, um, without doing it in a more sophisticated way. Yes. Yes, yes, it, it's, it, well, it's extracted, right? So we say, we, we know this is tagged with a unique ID for the professors, um, and then we know how to get bio snippets out for those professors. So we don't do it as a join, we do it as two steps, um, but there's a block for the related content. And it's like four lines of PHP, all right? plus a global, kind of a global library that renders XML. Other questions about that? Okay, we also have faceted search. We have a, a, a Google search appliance, which unfortunately Google's getting rid of. We have to replace it soon uh, for just searching our web pages, but we also pull people back from the directory, which is also run from the content system from ExistDB, and from, this is other stuff that's in the exist DB. So this is now faceted search, um, which has been very useful for us. Folks love that. All right. So now we've got an experience where people can just navigate to what they're interested in. And that's what those kind of lines show over there. Um, Mr. Nielsen of the Nielsen Ratings said, users want to construct their own experiences by piercing together content from multiple sources, emphasizing their desires in the current moment. I'm sure you all know that because you probably engaged in that as you surf and do whatever. Um, I don't know how many, uh, is anybody in here involved in higher ed? Okay, so go to websites, pick a university, go to your alumni site, whatever. 
Most of them are really hard to navigate. And I know we have places that are hard to navigate. We're constantly trying to make it better and better. You go to sites, especially public schools, you go to sites, chemistry will look different than biology, which will do, I mean, they're all different. They have different styles or different groups. I'm lucky, I work at a very small school. We're 3,500 FTEs, full-time students, equivalent of full-time students. And uh, we have a president that says work together. Um, that's very unusual in higher ed. So he, you know, and we were working together before he showed up, but just made it easier when he got there. All right. <clears throat> Here's a very different look. So let me check the time. Um, we have this place called the Center for Civic Engagement. And their job is to find partnerships with nonprofits in Richmond, Virginia, which is where we're located, and connect students with those nonprofits so they can get service work, learn about the community, learn about service work, and where the folks that have the need get the need satisfied. All free labor, right? Um, and traditionally, students would go to the Center for Civic Engagement and say, I kind of want to read to elementary students. Um, or I want to work with rebuilding homes in, in, a, you know, in a bad neighborhood or whatever. And they would help them find the right partnership. Um, this replaces that. So if you look in the middle, it says issue. Students look up the issue they, are, they care about. Um, they click on the issue. They see the location for that in the city. They see the vendor. Um, here's more information on the vendor. And then hopefully they pick a place. This is revolutionized. Now, this sounds, for us in the technology business, probably like, well, that's pretty easy. Yeah, it is actually pretty easy, but in higher ed, no one ever thinks about these things, okay? This has revolutionized their business. Students walk in going, I want to work on this project. So now that group can do more with less. And, and they're not cutting staff, they're just doing more work in the community. It is totally revolutionized um, how they do business. And all of that content comes out of ExistDB. And then, of course, we did the map stuff. And why do we do it? Well, this is why we do it. You know, the outcome is for the students. Okay, so, really, faculty don't always understand this, but our constituency is not students, it's not staff, it's not faculty. It's prospective students and their parents. Um, and a few guidance counselors in high schools and whatever. That's who we do this for. Because without prospects, we don't get students, and without students, we don't graduate. All right, so here's a quote. This is typical. I'm not gonna read it, you can read it. It's a typical quote. I walk across campus, you know, all the time to meetings or whatever. I run into people, they always look lost because parking lots are never labeled right. And they're like, well, what do you do here? And I'm like, I do the web. And they're like, we're here because of the web. I mean, I've heard that like 10 times in the last two years. We're here because your website was so attractive. It was so easy to use or whatever. Um, just like this. All right. We're also, we've gotten rid of at least 400 person hours in um, admissions. Uh, the application rate has gone up partly because of the web, partly because of other factors. Um, and the prospects get to do more self-service, and we're not done yet. So we have a CRM replacement going on right now for admissions, and we'll be tightly integrated with them in about six months. Okay. Um, we stopped printing catalogs. We started uh, putting catalogs into XML um, before ExistDB, um, but we shoved them into Oracle. Um, that that worked, but it was problematic in terms of effort. Um, all of our catalogs and most of our schedules are now in this back end, um, and we're not printing 20,000 or so variety of print publications a year. We're saving trees, um, we're saving money, we're not printing an di annual directory anymore of people, that's also coming out of this system. So, so we're saving trees, and that's a lovely tree near the school, not on campus. But all right, now, agility. Time is money, right? So how do we get the agility? Well, we start with a data definition, and here is a rundown. Data definitions take a couple minutes to a couple hours to create. Um, the middleware system takes five minutes to add um, the endpoints in. If we have to add a new transform, most of the transforms we can just reuse and reconfigure. 
But if we have to add a new one, it's usually about 10 hours of, or less of programming. The X query is anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours. Most of it's in the 30 minute range that's programming. About 30 minutes to code it, to shove it in the DOM object. And then putting it in the pages is not relevant because we'd have to do that anyway. So in a day, we can add a new content type or in two days. Okay, usually the problem is where's the content coming from? Some groups got it created. Um, so people come to us and they're like, oh, we know this is really hard and we always play dumb. Yeah, this is really hard. It's so much work. Da, 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 da. And then we're done with it by the time they've um, gotten back to their desk and we've got it enabled and then we just wait for them. Okay. Um, we have 56, 56 integrated content types. Um, I think there's another one that's missing up here. I think there's 57 now. Course evals, study abroad, press releases, reporting positions, um, admission blog system. We have we got rid of WordPress for admissions and student bloggers that blog for the benefit of the university. It's all in um, ExistDB um, with the content management system. So, how do we know it worked? Well, when we released Koi Pond One, we're now at Koi Pond Three. That's the name of like weird names, right? Koi Pond. Uh, long story, I'm not going to go into it. The bounce rate dropped pretty precipitously when we rolled it out. We added a bunch more content types, tweaked the CSS and a couple other tweaks and stuff that we like when it went live. We're like, oh, I hate that. Don't you do that? Like, you probably, when your projects are done, you like hate the project. All right, and you find all the weak spots, and everybody else is like, well, we really love this. But we hated it, so we fixed that there a few months later, and look at it, it plummeted. So it's running at about 45% um, bounce rate. Um, that's across everything, rolled up. All right, so here, this is dramatic. So if we look at this, the, the light blue is um, the, in the middle bar is um, the, either the minutes on site or the pages you touch, um, if you've touched the calendar somewhere in your visit, and the calendar events are done in this system, 170% and 243% increase. This is working from an engagement standpoint. If it wasn't, we'd probably rip it out and do something else. If you touched a feature article, time on site goes up because you're reading the article probably more than anything. You're probably linking to a couple other articles. Um, page views goes up 173% there. This is how we know it works, okay? Folks don't complain about being marketed to. It's actually kind of hard to find what we're ranked um, for US News and World Report and all that. Um, what they do find out, and what every prospect wants to know is, am I gonna fit in? That's what they all wanna know. They already kind of know the SAT scores that are needed and all that, am I gonna fit in? So the stories, the feature articles are about the experience and from that they can read it and say, yeah, I can relate to this or I can't. Um, <clears throat> mobile users, most of them are coming back multiple times a day on the left. So look at the bar up there. And um, the number of visits they have in a month are, some are coming back, um, you know, 50 to 100 times, 200 times or more. So we know the mobile's working as well. Most of the mobile content comes out of the same system. All right, and mobile users stay on the site about 15 minutes, which is amazing. My poor eyes, they don't work so much on them. <laughs> okay, why exist? Well, it's schemaless, it's XML. You know, you all probably, most of you probably hear about scale, performance, scale, performance, key value, which one should we be in? But it's all about scale and performance, 100 million users, whatever. You know, for us, it's really about ease of use, it's about agility and content discovery. The engagement numbers you just saw is, a, you know, they, they're finding the content and they're getting engaged in, with the content. We like Exist first because it's open source. Um, it's a perfect fit for us. If we were running, you know, 100 gigabytes of data, we'd probably need more clay logic or something. But for us, it's perfect. Our data is about 100 megabytes. We probably have 20 to 30,000 documents in it now. Uh, the full text is uh, Lucene, which is now called Solar. Is it called? Okay, all right, so, um, and it works, the search works good, um, the search is uniform across everything we do other than the, the Google search appliance, but most people use the faceted search, 
It's easy and it's flexible. Um, Dan came in and trained us. Um, we had to do a mental shift because it's functional programming. We're procedural programmers, PHP, whatever. Um, and it took a couple months for us to get our head wrapped around XML as a first class object instead of treating it like text. Um, but once we did that, we, we just do really, really well. The guy that does most of the XQuery programming touches it in a given week, maybe zero, maybe two hours, some weeks maybe eight. But mostly, he's probably averaging about an hour and a half or two hours of XQuery work a week. He just does it, boom, boom, boom. He did a little side project for us, something totally unrelated to this, something outside the university, and he built four XQuery modules in like 90 minutes. And they work, no bugs, just work. It's easy, so we like it. We're big fans, and it runs. It just keeps running, um, and that's it. That's my wordly slide at the end. So, questions? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, geez. Um, I wish I had a picture. <clears throat> Um, so, um, check the time, I, okay, we have plenty of time. So, uh, the digital libraries group um, is, uh, that we have two kind of digital information groups that are not public web. We have the Digital Scholarship Lab, which is about digitizing things and analyzing it from a humanities standpoint. Um, they just got an $800,000 grant from the Mellon Foundation to build um, an American atlas uh, from the early 1700s through the late 1800s, um, all, all maps, and it's, some of it will be in ExistDB. The maps themselves will be in S3. Um, we also have a digital library group. They digitize stuff and make it accessible uh, is the easy thing to say about it. Um, their first big project, they came to uh, us to help style and then to teach them how to use exist, then we built some visualizations in it. Um, Virginia, um, 151 years ago, 152 years ago, um, voted to secede from the Union um, in, at the beginning of the Civil War. Somebody got all that information together and in the early 1960s, some editors published a book. We got the rights to use the text from the books copyright permission, it was all digitized and turned into TEI encoded documents. And we built a discovery system on top of it for the president. Um, and they're learning new things about why the vote actually took place. It's not always obvious. And it's got density maps and it's got all kinds of visualization. So um, collections.richmond.edu will redirect to it if you're interested, it's really cool. Um, we're now working with them on um, we have the, the largest collection of Japanese um, war crime tribunal, tribunal documents in the world. Um, they're now digitized, but they're not online yet. Um, that will be in ExistDB. Um, they also have the Digital Dispatch, which is, um, the local newspaper is called the Times Dispatch. It was originally called the Dispatch. And they have, I don't know, 100 years of um, dispatch um, publications of the local newspaper and they're all TEI encoded um, and they're, that's a current project they're going to be put online with a discovery layer on top of it. So, um, and Exist just makes that easy. We don't even think about the Exist piece anymore. The hard part's just getting all that content, you know, and encoded in TEI and making it look good. The, the designers want to make it really look good. So is that? Yeah. yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question because I just totally <laughs> didn't even think about going over there. So, and it runs on a different server just for isolation purposes. Yes, sir. Um, Exist is um, is an open source XML database. So it's, it runs as, a, in most cases, you run it as a service. We run, we're Linux based, um, but we also run it on the Mac for, um, you know, for development purposes. So it's written in Java, it's got a, uh, an API, and it's got, it's wrapped in Jetty. Do you, if you all know Jetty, Jetty's like kind of a embedded Tomcat-ish, like a Java server page, right? 
Um, so it's wrapped in Jetty, and so it makes web stuff with it really easy. So, okay. Other questions? Yeah, you can boost search. You, I mean, you can customize it so that, you know, for example, if some, if some phrase is found in a title, you can say that's more important um, than if it was in the body. Um, you can do, you can actually do proximity searches. We don't do too much of that. Um, we, we love it. Um, it's a full text search engine. Um, the only time we have problems with it if, is with the directory if somebody's got a name that's in the stop list. So we have a person whose last name is Will, and Will's in the stop list. So we have to remove Will from the stop list. Um, otherwise, they, they never find Will in the directory. But minor details, right? That's why we're paid, you know, to figure that stuff out. So, all right. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you all.